am now going to open this up and officially invite you. And we are recording this, which is the slight delay there as I found the record button because we realized that noon Eastern time may not be convenient to everybody. And so we're hoping that this is something that can have a life beyond um, this live event. But we hope that this live event may have a little energy to it as well. So let me just start, first of all, by, by saying welcome. On behalf of the Outreach Foundation, I'm Marilyn Borst, and um, I am the Associate Director for Partnership Development for the Outreach Foundation. I've been in that role for going on 12 years, I think. I was going to say 11 years, but last year was kind of a blur, and I have to kind of add that in. So, um, and part of, or the large part of my focus at the Outreach Foundation is working with partners in the Middle East. Um, my portfolio, as it were, but much beyond that, it is a, a great, wonderful call that God has put upon my life to help connect particularly churches and individuals here in the United States with the church globally around the world. And in the case of, of this, in this particular instance, with Syria and Lebanon, um, a place that outreach travels to quite extensively um, and quite regularly. And some of you on this call have been part of one or more of those journeys um, to that part of the world. And when we get rolling here in just a minute, when I start screen sharing, um, I'm going to give you, I hope, kind of a, a rollicking trip through that part of the world, touching very lightly. Um, on a number of things, but we're trying every time we do one of these third Thursday tracks is to also have on this call with us one of our partners from that part of the world. Um, we actually have two on here because I see Reverend Joseph Kassab um, down in the bottom of my screen who is on here, but who is a dear friend and partner and you'll see him in the presentation as well. But I actually invited my friend Najla Kassab, and hopefully Najla is, she is unmuted, to bring a greeting, but before any greetings take place in the Middle East, or while those greetings take place, one of the essential parts of that is coffee. You are always offered coffee in the Middle East, and um, Najla and I are having ours, and you'll note that it's not in the big mug, some of you have that, but in the wonderful little demitasses which in the Middle East marks a really thick aromatic coffee, often laced with cardamom, which is how I make my coffee when I make the Arabic style of coffee. I always tell my team, you know, whenever you walk into any kind of meeting or home, even if it's a small casual thing, the, almost the first word after welcome is, would you like coffee? And the answer to that always must be yes. Even if you're not a coffee drinker, as I often tell my friend, Julie Burgess, who is on the Zoom call, because if you don't drink it, then you will quietly pass it to me and I will have a second or third cup. So Najla, we welcome you here. Najla, let me tell you, is one of the pastors of the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon, has been on staff with the Synod almost, I think, as long as I've known her, some 20 plus years. Um, but in addition to that role, which is overseeing the Christian education for the churches of the Synod in Syria, Lebanon, Najla for the past number of years, has had the responsibility and the honor of being the president of the World Communion of Reformed Churches. Um, so she connects to literally our Reformed family all over the world for which we are thrilled to have that voice from the Middle East. But for this purpose, she is our friend, Najla, and I asked her to bring greetings to us as we contemplate this virtual, we hope again to be actual trip to her countries. Najla. Nash unmute, Najla, unmute. Thank you, Marlon. It's so good to see many faces I know and some new faces. Welcome for to be with us on a tour. 
And you know, one of the difficulties that we faced with the corona is that we cannot tour as much, but we are in hope that soon we will be able, you will be able to come and visit us. One term that the outreach taught me that you share love with presence. And the presence of the outreach in, in Lebanon and in Syria has changed us as a church. We, we, we thank God for the groups who visited us in the past, and we trust that the tour will continue to come and meet people and to be changed. And I want to confess that we are changed also with your visits to us. Uh, Lebanon is a beautiful country and Syria too. Don't think only of what you see on TVs or on the news, but come and see the beauty of nature, of people, of the church, of what God is doing here, despite all the challenges and how God is using the outreach for change. We have been in a long uh, journey together and we thank God for these moments of sharing, starting from the coffee, to the tea, to praying together, to learning new things. And as the Easterners, we are learning as well with these tours because we come to see uh, how uh, others see our country. Uh, we hope that this tour, I will be with you because I'm interested as well to be on this tour and to discover uh, what, uh, the beauty of coming together, the beauty of trusting, uh, of a hopeful time together with the outreach. For those who have not come yet, I would say it will change you. And for those who came before, I know they cannot stop, but they keep coming and coming and coming. And we thank God for this time together as churches for discovering the beauty of God in people, in nature, and in our being together. I hope to see you in person, okay? And I welcome you on this tour. I want to thank my sister Marlon, mm -hmm. who never gets tired of bringing groups and uh, encouraging us to meet, even virtually. Thank you, and we hope that this time of virtual will be, will be behind us one day and we can see each other face to face. Welcome and enjoy the tour. Thank you, dear Najla, and, and honored that you're gonna stick with us. Um, friends, now we kind of transition and this is always the part I fear. And so you will all, um, bear with me as I pull up a PowerPoint. Can you all see that? Nod back and forth. Julie, I'm, I see you, so you nod vociferously. And I'm going to start with my title slide. Now, all of you have probably been on enough Zoom calls that you know to go up in that upper right-hand corner and maybe bring down the viewing box. So maybe you're only seeing me. Um, on the other hand, if you don't wanna see my face, you're welcome to just obliterate that as well. Um, but there will be a few visual cues a little bit later on. So you might wanna leave me up and it makes me feel like I'm part of you. But friends, once again, welcome to a new venture on behalf of the Outreach Foundation. I know I recognize many faces from um, the initial kind of log on with many of you and some I have not seen before. So particularly welcome on behalf of the Outreach Foundation to your church to your Presbyterian family, perhaps we might say, we'd love for you to be part of what we're doing either in Syria or Lebanon or to the many places where Outreach Foundation um, is connecting around the world, learning at the feet of the global church. So as we start out, this particular focus, um, as you know, is upon Lebanon and Syria. And if you wonder why that is kind of a, an unusual pairing or why those things are paired together. 
Um, if you're not familiar with our Presbyterian family in the Middle East, and that's fine if you aren't, hopefully you will be a little bit more by the time we're done. Um, let me tell you that, the, that Lebanon and Syria as the Presbyterian church are all under one wonderful umbrella, the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon. Um, and we are actually honored to have the general secretary of that synod with us, Reverend Joseph Kassab. I'll make a, an introduction in this presentation a little bit later on for uh, of him. But roughly speaking, half of the churches of the synod, about 20 of them are in Lebanon, about half in Syria. This particular um, fast-paced journey is going to focus more on Lebanon this time around with a little bit of a touch in Syria, mainly in the interest of time. And I, it already occurred to me that I probably need to do a separate one um, about Syria at some point. But when outreach goes to that region, we try whenever possible to get to both countries because of the unity of the body of Christ in those places. This is one of my favorite pictures. I did not take this, by the way. I was not hanging out um, the window of my Air France flight going into beautiful Beirut, but I wanted you to see this because it also captures some of the stunningly wonderful contrast that is the country of Lebanon, which is the beaches that you see in the foreground. But if you look off to the mountains in the background and focus, you will notice there is snow. Lebanon has it all. One of the, the little kind of truisms is that you can be skiing in the morning and you can be swimming in the afternoon. Lebanon is that condensed. It's only about the size of Connecticut, by the way. So you can move through the country quite easily and see all of the wonderful diversity, but the heart of Lebanon is this pulsating city that is Beirut. Now, you already met um, Reverend Najla Kassab, one of the pastors of the Synod who just welcomed us. The handsome man on the other side of me is her husband, Reverend Joseph Kassab, um, who has been a longtime friend. Joseph is the, is the general secretary of the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon. In other words, he is in charge of our church family there um, and has been an incredible host to invite Outreach Foundation into partnership, into mutual mission. We'll touch on some of those things um, in just a minute. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures of Joseph, by the way, as we were in Syria. The last time we were there was about a year ago, this past February, um, visiting as many of the congregations of Syria as we possibly could. We stopped in the little town of Nebek, about an hour due north of Damascus, to meet with one of the families of the church there. And this precious little guy who you see here was someone who Joseph had just baptized the previous November, a precious little child of the church whose name is Christian. Um, and so they were reunited there in the home of a relative. But again, this wonderful kind of a union of the continuity of the church, even in difficult places, people ask the question, you know, what is happening to the church? Here you see it, God is still building his church and renewing his church in many places. And part of that renewal, that equipping of the church comes through the work of our sister Najla, particularly in her role as the director of Christian education for the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon. As I mentioned, there are about 20 congregations of the Synod of Syria and Lebanon. When we are there, we try to touch base with as many of them as possible. We can't do all of them, but I want you to meet two of them on this journey. One of them is the largest of the churches of the Synod in Lebanon, which is just outside of Beirut in a suburb called Rabia which is also, Rabi rather, which is also on the, kind of on the property of the Synod, the Synod offices. There's also a, a, one of the schools run by the Synod, but Rabi Church is one of those wonderful welcoming environments um, that is usually packed out on Sundays, often with visitors. In fact, that little cluster of people that you see there here in the foreground, which includes my husband, um, is in fact, there are so many visitors to the Church of Rabi that they have already set up translation sets. So whenever 
Whenever somebody comes in who doesn't speak Arabic, the church is ready to start translating the service, call someone out of the congregation who's fluent in English, which by the way, includes most of the population um, of Lebanon. One of the questions people who have not traveled to that part of the world often ask is, how do you make your way in an Arabic speaking country? And I always point out to them that in Lebanon, almost everybody is bilingual, English and Arabic, and many people are are trilingual English, Arabic, and French. And so communication is not a problem by any stretch of the imagination. In that church, you meet many of the wonderful families who are part of the life and the work and witness of the Synod, like Hala Batar, the woman you see here on the right, a member of this church, who is also a teacher in one of the Synod schools as well. You would meet Reverend George Marad, who is one of the pastors of the Synod, the, the pastor of this church as well, um, a very um, gregarious, welcoming individual, someone who it's pretty much impossible to come to Lebanon as a Presbyterian and not meet. But there are also churches of the Synod that are much smaller and yet no less impactful in their footprint in this country. One of them that our outreach found uh, foundation teams usually try to touch base with because it feeds our soul is the church of the Synod that is found way up in the north part of Lebanon in the city of Tripoli, very close to the border with Syria. And if this looks like a, a church that is right in the the heart of a densely packed city, that's exactly what it is. It literally sits on a um, kind of a promontory uh, of a block with all of the dense um, activities of this busy city around it. And this church is pastored by a wonderful pastor of the Synod, who is Reverend Rula Schliemann. You see her there in the pulpit. And this was a, 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 an August day, by the way, when a lot of people, an August hot Sunday, when people leave for cooler climates, which is why the population is, is so reduced. But it is a small church, but it is a church who under the leadership of Reverend Rula Schliemann um, has made a great impact for the gospel in her context. One of the realities of Lebanon, by the way, is that this country of only 4 million people during the war in Syria, which began back in 2012, began to receive refugees flooding into this country, upwards of 1.2 million Syrian refugees in a country of only 4 million. And of course, the church is always called to respond to crisis and to how can the church be salt and light in difficult circumstances. Well, the response of our family that is the National Evangelical Synod of Syria, Lebanon, was recognizing that even as a small part of the body of Christ, there was something that could be done and to utilize the gifts that the Synod had and the skills and the history that the Synod had in education, in running schools to say, we can reach out to Syrian refugees and we can bring them in and create schools specifically for them. In the city of Tripoli, by the way, there was this old whale of a building that was one of the first schools built in Lebanon by the missionaries back in the 1800s. The Tripoli school had long since been left for a newer facility that the Synod had built, but they kept the old building. And as this refugee crisis developed, the Synod began to open schools often in facilities that they already owned in the case, in this particular case, this old school of the Synod in Tripoli. And so Reverend Rula, many of the, her church members, you know, showed up to be salt and light welcoming young Syrian students, Syrian students who were refugees in that land. The Synod, by the way, has done this in three other places around Lebanon. When Outreach Foundation goes, we always stop to see at least one of these refugee schools because it is a powerful ministry um, of hope and of light. 
when we return to Lebanon again, hopefully later this year, we'll, I'll talk more about that, hopefully in October trip, one of the realities, the new realities of the work and witness of the Synod will be to, to learn more and to see more of the, of the ministry that they developed in the aftermath of the terrible explosion that hit the port of Beirut and on August 6 of this past year, we won't go into the details because we had so much news on it. But one of the realities of that, as we all know, was the destruction of so many buildings and the terrible damage that was done to homes in this otherwise in this densely packed city that is Beirut. And so one of the ministries that was developed by the Synod was something they called Beirut Hope which is to provide small grants of, of money to homeowners all through this area that was damaged so that they could begin to rebuild. This was done through their diaconal arm. Outreach Foundation has been a part of that. And so I look forward to an opportunity to see this work and where it is progressing when we return again. In addition to our visits to Syrian churches, we also always make a stop at the seminary that trains young men and women for ministry throughout the Middle East, the Near East School of Theology, which is this kind of fortress-like building that you see there, this multi-story concrete structure. Um, the Near East School of Theology is a joint venture that trains both Presbyterians as well as Lutherans and Episcopal students for, for ministry in the Middle East, but for our purposes, it is where almost all of the pastors of the Synod are trained as well. Like young Schliemann, who you see here, um, who comes from the city, from the town of Maharde, right in the center of Syria. We always meet there with the president, um, Dr. George Sabra. By the way, what he's holding in his hand, you in his hands, you may be of interest to know, um, is um, the Arabic translation of Kelvin's Institutes um, that most of us or many of us studied and, and grew up with in our reform tradition. This is the Arabic version of that. But in addition, we always meet with students who are there. This is actually a bygone group of students because all of these students are now out of seminary, but I want to note a couple of them for you. One of them, this by the way, is um, our board president. He's not a student at, at Neary School of Theology, but um, Reverend Dr. Jack Baca is a pastor out in um, Southern California area, and Jack is the board chair, and he has developed an enormous heart for this part of the world, and so rarely do I do a trip that Jack is not part of. But standing next to Jack is Mathilde Sabah, who is a graduate of the seminary. Her brother is already an ordained pastor in the synod, serving the church of Feruze outside of Homs, and Mathilde herself is pastoring the church of Hasake, way up in the northeast corner of Syria, kind of where Syria kind of comes to a point surrounded by Iraq and Turkey. This is where this young woman um, is serving and serving proudly. Um, the, the two young men that you see here, Adon and Youssef, are recent graduates of about a year ago, and they are currently on their kind of practicum, their rotation, um, serving different churches in Syria to get different types of, of ministerial um, experience. The Outreach Foundation partners with a number of ministries in Lebanon that are not part of the Synod but have a close um, spiritual connection to the Synod. Um, one of those ministries that we always visit and which Outreach Foundation has been a part of um, is the Blessed School which is this old building located in a kind of a poor suburb, a densely packed suburb of Beirut that was founded more than 100 years ago as a school for the blind. Now with most of the blind students mainstreamed in education in Lebanon, the director who you see here, Linda Mac Tabby now um, teaches and nurtures primarily autistic students. 
And so her program for autistic students, which includes not just kind of basic education, but often basic job training where that is possible, teaching them skills, having them work in a bakery, learning um, um, skill sets like small crafts and basketry and caning. Um, it is a wonderful, loving environment, um, nurturing these students, some who are residential, to this to this building others who are on a day program but it is a wonderful ministry christian ministry in that place another one of the ministries that outreach foundation has partnered with um, is a ministry in the baka valley which is where many of the syrian refugees ended up some of them in formal camps like you saw in that kind of um, beginning slide that I showed you uh, formal camps that have been put together by you know international organizations like the United Nations many of them are in kind of makeshift camps as you see here one of the ministries that began working with these with these with these Syrian refugees was begun by a friend of many of ours in Lebanon Isdahar Kassis um, who lives near these tents and on her normal everyday life began to see so many of these women in the streets of her town, Zahle, um, as well as um, their children, their young babies. And she became so incredibly, incredibly um, touched by the plight of these young women that she said, I need to somehow reach out to these young mothers who are living in camps and particularly to help in whatever way possible to make sure that these young babies, these young children got the best possible start they could in an otherwise dismal situation. And so she began a ministry, we just call it affectionately the baby ministry of making sure that these children, these young babies have nutrition, medical care, whatever is needed to kind of launch them into their first phase of life. This is a ministry that is primarily with a non-Christian population and yet um, having been with Istahar and her zeal for Christ, her love of Christ, guarantees that every time she serves these women, these families, not only the babies, but the children as well, there is a story of the good news of the God who is love. It is a powerful ministry that we always try to touch base with. You know, on a practical level, and this is one of the things I wanted, Why, the, I, as I said to Nashua before you all got on, I said, you know, this is a little bit different than what I normally do when I speak or I preach in a church, which is to give, you know, kind of a full throttle, you know, here is the work and witness of the church and kind of go deep into those ministries. I did a little bit of that, am doing a little bit of that, but I also wanted people to have a sense of what it's like to travel to this part of the world. And so it is the fun, the practical side, where do we stay, what do we eat, how do we get around? Because if you've never been to that part of the world, sometimes it seems kind of daunting. And so I wanted to demystify, familiarize yourself with it. So in answer to the question, how do you move around in Lebanon? One of the ways we move around sometimes are in these wonderful mini buses, um, which you can see just part of the labeling there, the Beirut Evangelical School for Girls and Boys, which is one of those schools of the Synod. And particularly when we're there in the summertime and the school is not in session, um, we have a use of one of these wonderful air conditioned buses and sometimes we have a local guide um, and I say that sort of affectionately because this is no local guide. This is one of the great saints of the church in Lebanon and Syria. Dr. Mary Mikael, who is now retired, but she was for 17 years the president of Near Eastern School of Theology. She was the first woman to ever head up a seminary in the Middle East. She is now retired and has been in tireless service to the Synod, working with those refugee schools, but we also hope pouring her deep experience into the theology of this place, the Bible through Middle Eastern eyes. Anyway, a dear friend of the Outreach Foundation um, and someone we look forward to seeing every time we're there. So where do we stay when we go to Lebanon? Well, we have a home away from home, and it is this wonderful little hotel kind of nestled in the heart of Beirut called the Casador. Here you see one of our teams. I think this was the last team from about a year and a half ago. You see Julie Burgess, 
there who I know is on this call right there, Julie and her husband, Steve. And as I said, the ubiquitous Jack Baca, who is often with me, who may be on this, so I probably shouldn't call him ubiquitous because he is my boss as the president of the Outreach Foundation, but a wonderful traveling companion. The Casa Dor treats us like family. We stay there so often and wanted you to know that one of the highlights of staying at the Casa Dor, by the way, is the wonderful breakfast buffet, just in case you thought you might go hungry, um, going to a part of the world you're not familiar with, that would not be the case. This is just the opening meal. This is the buffet every morning at the Casa Dor. And if you ask the staff nicely, they will also bring you eggs. And if they really like you, the eggs will smile at you when you get them back. So just one of the things that you can look forward to. Um, one of the things ab about knowing this part of Beirut and the fact that Beirut is such a compact little city is, you know, people often ask, is it, is it safe to walk or run or exercise? You know, when you're on the road on these kind of trips, you take in so many calories, you do a lot of sitting, as you know, it feels good to get out and get some exercise. Well, just two blocks down the street from the hotel, you come across this wonderful, rather daunting old facade of what is the American University in Beirut, the AUB, which was a, a, a school, a, a university, now one of the finest universities in the Middle East, founded by Presbyterian missionaries now over 150 years ago. And inside the walls of AUB, you're welcome to go. It's a wonderful walk has their own little archeological museum as well. But as I said, one of those wonderful benefits of staying where we stay in Beirut. Because my background, as some of you know, um, is as an art historian and an archeologist, there is very few places that I take groups that I don't insist that we enjoy and experience part of the great culture um, of the city, of the country where we are. And so there are so many things to choose from, from in Beirut, but I wanted to highlight a couple of the things that I often make a top part of the visit. One is this wonderful small museum called the Sarsouk Museum. Um, Nicholas Sarsouk was, a, was a, um, a businessman who had a great heart for the arts. When he died, he gave his palace, his home over to the, the, um, to the arts, and you can tour it now, you can visit it, and not only does it have incredible architectural details, but it has become the home for an incredible collection of contemporary art um, in Beirut, which is one of the reasons why I love to go there. On the other end of the historical spectrum, not far from the Sarsouk Museum is the legendary Beirut Museum, which is what you see here, that houses an incredible collection of the antiquities of this ancient land. It's sculpture, it's, um, uh, it's uh, mosaics, as you can see here. One of the newest installations in the museum is this incredible collection of, of um, anthropoid coffins that were found at an excavation site at the ancient, um, in the ancient city of Tyre. So just one of the things that we try to, to do. When time allows, and depending upon where we are, we often will make visits to some of the great historical sites in Lebanon, which include places like Baal Bek, which is a, a late Roman Empire site, incredible to behold. This was our group from a number of years ago on a cold winter day, by the way. I said we kind of looked like the, um, the Outreach Foundation Mafia standing here, but um, dressed all in black. As I said, it was a cold day. One of the other wonderful places we visit is the city of Byblos, which is also legendary, one of the great ancient Phoenician sites, among other things, with beautiful shopping and these arcaded historic places. There you see our happy group there taking a selfie. Um, that's Reverend Marshall Zeman, who is on this call pastor in um, Omaha, Nebraska. Thank you, Marshall, for that lovely picture where we're all having a really good time together. Um, the site of Tyre, by the way, as in Sidon and Tyre, those ancient names from the Bible. Tyre, of course, was the place um, legendary to King Hiram, um, who sent cedars from Tyre down to for the building of the first temple in Jerusalem, but it is also a fantastic Roman site. It now houses, in fact, one of the best preserved Roman hippodromes, one of the horse racing places in all of the Roman Empire. Let's talk a little bit about food. I already started out with Najla by sharing a cup of coffee, and when you're on a mission trip, 
with the Outreach Foundation, coffee is part of the leet motif um, of the day, we might say, certainly of the morning. There are many stops for coffee. Let's just go with that. Excellent coffee. Here, my dear friend, um, Patty Gatsky, um, and I having some of that wonderful Arabic coffee laced with cardamom, as I insist. Food is an integral part of, of course, of our life, but no one raises food to the fine art as do the Lebanese. Um, and one of the challenges of food in a place like Lebanon is the variety and the amount that comes to you. Um, this is, I saw Carol Weinberg um, right in the chat um, room that she would bring the meza, the meza which is those first little courses, those little dishes that come to the table. This is not the main course. This is the precursor to the main course, which is why showing restraint is one of the challenges of traveling to a place like Lebanon. But it is a place, if you like seafood, it is an incredible place for a variety of seafood because of its location. One of the things I learned to love there are these little tiny miniature sardines which are fried lightly to perfection. You dip them in this wonderful sauce of garlic and tahini. They are magnifique. And can we talk fried calamari? No one does it quite as good as they do it in Lebanon. Now, food can have an adventurous part of it as you're in different parts of the world. This is one of my favorite stories about adventurous food experiences. And it was the time that I had a group of my, um, uh, of my ladies that I sometimes travel to Lebanon with. We had gone to an Armenian restaurant and our host who was Armenian, Sadie, handed me the menu and said, you've been here so many times, Marilyn, why don't you choose what you like? So I proceeded with the, with the, the you know, the introductory course, the meza, with all the things that, you know, I was familiar with, things like hummus and baba ganoush and shanglish salad. But then I saw something on the menu, perhaps because it was an Armenian restaurant I'd never seen before, and it, they were called lamb balls. And so I said to Sadie, I just assumed, I says, are these like meatballs? And I was trying to kind of describe, I said, you know, like minced meat, and then they're, and she kind of nodded, but kind of went, eh, sort of like that. And I said, well, let's, let's get those. I've never had those before. Well, they came to the table. Here you see them. I could get them. I could order them fried or sauteed. I thought it was more elegant to have them sauteed. So they were sauteed in um, olive oil with a little dusting of um, um, pine nuts. And as I was eating them, I realized they were not meatballs. And it finally dawned on me that the ball part of them was something that Sadie did not have the English for, namely testicles, we were eating lamb testicles and they were good. And I made everybody try one of them at the table. Now to clear your palate, if you're not inclined to lamb testicles, sweets, no one does sweets better than they do in Lebanon. And here's one of those typical varieties that you would find often your host or hostess is serving you with that wonderful thick Arabic coffee. But it is also not unusual for us to stop at one of the many places that specialize in sweets. Julie Burgess and I refer to them often as the temple to the sweets because they are usually large glistening establishments that are chock full of those wonderful sweets, but in addition, ice cream is available. And at this particular one that we often stop at on the way to Sidon, an incredible cappuccino, just a little bit of what to look forward to. Now, at the end of the day, you might want to have a glass of something a little more serious. And you may not know that Lebanon has developed an incredible reputation as a wine producing country. There are many beautiful vineyards, particularly in the Baca Valley. Um, one of those vineyards that I have not visited, but whose wine is available right here in Atlanta, is Moussar Jaune, is the wine, Cafe Moussar. Wonderful Lebanese wines, highly recommended. Of course, in my house, we buy them mainly for in-home communion, but highly recommended. 
One of the wonderful um, facilities, we might say, that is owned by the Senate in Lebanon is an old, ancient, uh, not ancient, but an old structure of stone buildings that has been developed primarily by Najla Kassab into a wonderful retreat and conference center in Dur Shwer, just to the north of Beirut. And this is a place where over time, this has developed into a wonderful accommodating place for small groups to come. We've stayed here with my group from time to time. It is beautifully sited up in the mountains. Um, just, I think it was just yesterday, Najla posted some wonderful pictures of winter. Look at this building here. Here is what it looked like yesterday. So Lebanon has been having some exceptionally heavy snows like many of us have been a part of. But one of the, one of the reasons why um, Outreach Foundation often ends up at Dur Schwer is for a women's conference in the summer. There you see Najla, Julie Burgess, I've mentioned before because she's traveled so often with me. And one of our wonderful sisters from Latakia, Syria, whose name is Muna Awad. Muna um, passed away last year. She was one of the great saints of the Presbyterian Church in Latakia. But at this women con women's conference, which the Synod holds every year to bring together women from the churches in Lebanon and Syria, over the past five years, Najla has graciously extended that invitation to us from the Outreach Foundation. And so we show up every year as we are able with a team to integrate with these women, to worship with them, to sing, to study scripture together. We take wonderful excursions as we build relationships and fellowship over many, many meals. And at the end of the day to have fun together making crafts, but also in bonding together as sisters in Christ. Lois Andrews, who I know is on this call from First Press San Diego here with one of those wonderful sisters, Mona Nasser, who is one of the leaders of the church in Latakia. And one of the reasons for sharing with this with you is this gathering of women from Lebanon and Syria for me is also kind of this wonderful bridging event given the fact that the Synod of Syria, Lebanon are family. Here is a place where you have those commingling of those two churches in very real ways. And that provides just a little bit of a launch to the tiny amount of time that I want to, to spend sharing with you a few glimpses of Syria. And as I said, because of the depth of ministry in this place, the reality, the history of this place, Syria deserves its own mission focus all by itself. But I wanted to touch on because they are so closely related to each other. And so I'm only gonna focus on one place and that is the city of Damascus. We're looking here through one of the ancient gates into the old part of the city, the East Gate and the street that, uh, that that spans out from that East Gate is a street that you may not know, but you are actually familiar with from scripture. It is the street called Straight from the story of the Apostle Paul. It is still there. This is what it looks like. You can stroll down it, you can shop along it, you can stop and have coffee at one of the many wonderful coffee shops that you see here, but not far off the street called Straight, just a few turns here and there, you would find yourself at our home away from home, the Presbyterian Church in Damascus, in the heart of old Damascus. This here congregation welcomes our team every time we are there. This was our group that was meeting there in February of last year. And here, this was um, my visit there this past summer. But the church has been pastored now going on close to 20 years by Reverend Boutros Zaur, um, who is also the, the current moderator of, this, of the Synod. It is a church that is vital in its mission and ministry with a vital women's group. Many of these women we meet every summer at Durschwer. It has Bible study. It has a vibrant young adult ministry. It has a blowing and going children's ministry called the Generation of Love. Um, on those visits to Damascus, by the way, and actually to many of the cities in Lebanon, 
we touch base with ecumenical partners because the church, the Presbyterian church does not exist alone. The Protestants in this part of the world um, are, this, are the minority of the minority, the Catholic, the Orthodox community is much larger, but the churches exist ecumenically together. And so we meet with those ecumenical leaders. One who has become a good friend of the Outreach Foundation is the Syrian Orthodox Bishop um, who is based in Damascus. His name is Ignatius Afrem, his beatitude Ignatius, who is, as I said, a dear friend of the Outreach Foundation um, and someone we try to see every time we're there, a man despite this rather august title, and who, by the way, is the 122nd successor of St. Peter in the Apostolic See of Antioch. I bet none of you have that on your resume. Well, Ignatius does his beatitude, but he is a man of great good humor. He spent, by the way, a number of years, I wanna say 17 years, as the Archbishop of New Jersey of all places. And so he speaks fluent English, has a wonderful sense of humor, is always incredibly welcoming of our Outreach Foundation teams when we come. Damascus, this enormously historic city, of course, is resplendent with things to see and to do. One of the ancient gates into the city is this one called the Gate of St. Paul, because legend has it this was the gate that Paul was lowered down from when he sensed that his enemies were upon him. You know the story. There is the ancient grotto of Ananias, who was, of course, the one who restored the site to the Apostle Paul. We can visit the great Umayyad mosques, one of the beautiful um, Islamic places of worship to be found. This is one of the most famous. And of course, the streets of ancient Damascus through the shopping districts that eventually lead to one of the historic souks or covered markets found anywhere um, in the Arab world today, the great market of Damascus, the souk, where you can find everything from spices, to gold and, as I said, everything in between. Along the topics of where do we stay when we travel to Syria, one of the, one of the truly unexpected pleasures of traveling to, Ma to Damascus is an incredibly beautiful little truly boutique hotel um, that we discovered quite a while back. It's called the Beit El Wali, and it's right in the heart of old Damascus. You would walk right past the door because you wouldn't even see it. It's kind of buried until you walk into it. The Beit El Wali is dates from the 18th century, and it is actually a series of three old Damascene houses that were linked together and renovated into this incredibly beautiful place, this little um, kind of haven, this little hideaway where we stay. By the way, the Beit El Wali backs up against the Presbyterian church. And so on Sunday mornings or other days where we have um, events with the church, we literally go out the back door, kind of the service door, and we're right into the yard of the Presbyterian church. Let's talk about food in Damascus and in Syria. This is Steve Burgess, by the way, who I think is also on this call. Um, I, this is the expression I would use to say more food because it comes and it comes and it comes. Syria also has some wonderful food preparations. I think this is a dish of, of um, eggplant that are baked in, in a wonderful kind of a yogurt sauce. The pizza at the Beit El Wali, by the way, is legendary. But one of the things that, Le that Syria is famous for, and particularly the city of Aleppo, which I cannot touch on in the interest of time, but it is a place that we always try to get to. But Aleppo is famous for its kibbeh, which is a minced meat that has been mixed with bulgur wheat and then served in a variety of different preparations, like a little cake who you see, it, you see there, little meatballs, and this one very notable one, which is those little kibbehs that have been simmered in like a thick yogurt sauce with dried mint. It is an incredible thing to, to behold. One of the popular dishes, by the way, in both Lebanon and Syria is raw kibbeh, which is essentially raw hamburger meat. 
Most things I will eat as I travel. This one I do try to pass by for a lot of reasons and my own stomach being one of them. But speaking of healthy things that restore life, one of the discoveries I made in Aleppo on our last trip there, it was a cold, wintry February that we were there. I had a terrible head cold that I could not shake. And as we were driving through old Aleppo, the pastor, Reverend Ibrahim Nasir said, I've got just the thing. He stopped in the middle of traffic, jumped out of the car, ran up to a little vendor and came back with this, this cup of, of a warm yogurt that is dust with cinnamon called salab, I think is the name of it. And it restored my spirit. It was kind of like drinking, sipping a warm blanket is how I describe it, but one of the wonderful treasures. I want to end with this image, and that is the heavenly banquet, um, an image that is very familiar to us, of course, from scripture that we will feast at the heavenly banquet. And of course, that feasting at the heavenly banquet is, is not just about what we eat at the banquet, but who we eat it with. This is such a typical picture. This is the church in Damascus its elders, its leaders inviting us to lunch at this extensive table to express their hospitality to us. And it, as I said, is not about what is on the plate, but who is at the table. And so this image of our family of faith in that place, stand or sitting in front of me is one of the elders of the church whose name is Sahar. To, to, to the right, as we're looking at the slide, is Reverend um, um, Samuel Hanna, a retired pastor of the Synod. And on the other side, Mike Kuhn, Reverend Mike Kuhn, who is a, a pastor and a, an Islamic scholar um, extraordinaire who has traveled with us and brought us great joy and, and great meaning to the Outreach Foundation teams as we have traveled. I'm going to get out of screen sharing here so I can see your faces. And I was one of the things I didn't invite you to do, but some of you may have thought to do it is, um, is if there's any questions of things that come to light um, or any reflection, some of you have been to these places would invite you to just unmute yourself and ask that question or, or speak to all of us. And I know Kelly has been watching the chat. So Kelly, if there's any specific kinds of questions I need to know about, throw those at me, but would welcome some of you, if you've got some specific things to share, would love to hear from you. Just unmute yourself. Um, there have been a couple questions yeah. in the chat, um, but it looks like some of the other participants have kind of answered. Um, so Jack responded to a couple and, and things like that. There was a question. The last time you were in um, Lebanon, uh, Gwen wanted to know, was the financial crisis happening while you were there, Marilyn? It was just beginning to unravel. This was in October, uh, two years ago, before last October. Tony um, Lorenz, Reverend Tony Lorenz was on that trip. We were actually on our way out of Lebanon, or out of Iraq, but going through Lebanon. This was in October, as I said, a year ago. Things had just started to unravel um, with the political unrest that then turned into the financial unrest, which then led into the banking crisis that pandemic and the explosion in the Beirut for, uh, uh, port. It was kind of the perfect storm. And yet in the midst of that all, as Julie has heard me say so often, the church, the church, the church, the church, the church continues to give work and witness to the good news and to serve its community despite all of the things that have happened in that place, which is what keeps drawing us back to sit at the feet of that church, to learn really what the true meaning of perseverance is, what it means to be the faithful, the faithful church through difficult times. This is the church that, that I encounter in a place like Lebanon and Syria. Julie, unmute yourself. I already did, you know how I am. <laughs> I, I just, I was listening intently as you went along and of course the faces um, of people bring me to tears and I, I made a, kind of a long chat about um, our dear uh, patriarch 
of the Syriac Orthodox Church to say that he, he succeeded um, the prior patriarch who had been abducted back in 2014 from, with his Greek Orthodox counterpart. And they've never, never heard uh, if they're alive or dead, but they do uh, memorialize that every year. The other thing, Marilyn, I was going to comment on was when you were talking about Tripoli and the evangelical school, that school actually wasn't closed um, for a long time. As you remember, uh, Dear Rula told us that the war in Syria came, of course, across the border there in the north um, because there was a kind of Sunni Shiite um, skirmish going on and and that school was still being used by the synod or the you know the evangelical school as it was while the new one was under construction um there were you know skirmishes there were bullets came right in the front door and kids were caught in kind of crossfire so they moved those kids to the new school while it was still under construction it wasn't officially completed yet and then they did turn that into a refugee school i just wanted i just wanted to say that so many of the people that we know there who we meet with regularly have experienced not only the Lebanese civil war, which Najla is so eloquent in speaking of, um, but this extra war in Syria has affected the church on both sides of the border in really kind of um, serious ways. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, and, and Julia, a, a little bit redundant for um, some of you who have traveled with me before, but it is always worth saying, particularly um, with the presence of some of the church here is I always, you know, say to my groups that, you know, one of the things I've discovered in traveling to this, these parts of the world, as some of you have, is that you read scripture in a whole new different way, because there are parts of scripture that I'm convinced were written not because for us, even though all of scripture is, you know, inspired by God and is beneficial, but when Paul wrote to the church and said things like, we are hard pressed, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. He didn't write that to West Hills Church in Omaha. He didn't write that to First Pres Omaha or First Pres Evanston. He didn't write it to First Pres Nashville. He didn't write it to Shaliford Presbyterian Church. He wrote it to the church in places like Syria. He wrote it to the church in places like Lebanon. And I no longer can read those pieces of scripture without seeing it through the eyes of the church that has endured and persevered with joy. Count it all joy, says Paul. And we have a hard time doing that. This is what we've discovered in these places, which is to me one of those little bonuses of showing up in these places we think we are going because we are an encouraging presence and I know we are Najla because you have said that I know we're an encouraging presence but it is so mutual it is so reciprocal in the very best possible way when Paul said to the church in Rome I long to see you that I may impart to you a spiritual gift wait that is that we may be mutually encouraged by one another's faith and that's what we encounter in these places and in so many other places that outreach shows up. Gwen, I see you. Raise yeah, I just want to make a comment that that uh, that that's how I felt about being on the road to Jericho mm -hmm. in in uh, in Israel. It's like, oh my God, I'm on the road to Jericho that I've heard about in the Bible so many times, and also in Turkey when I was in Ephesus. Yeah. And now, whenever I hear an epistle epistle to the Ephesians. I think of being there in, in the amphitheater in the road to, in, in Ephesus where Paul preached. Um, and so like, yeah, being in those places does keep, stay yeah. with you. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you. Um, we've, got, we've got a couple more questions. Um, Please. So Cheryl asked about the recording of this video. It will be available on the Outreach Foundation website. Um, we'll have a link on our homepage and under our trips page as well. That'll be up hopefully this afternoon, but definitely by tomorrow, um, just depending on how long that takes me. And there was, um, so yes, that will be available to Thank share. Um, and Carol had a question for Najla, if she's um, willing to answer. She asked, what kinds of subjects are you looking at in Christian education these days? Mm. Uh, you know, one of the things now we are not able to meet to do our programs uh, as a church face to face, 
we were in lockdown we, in Lebanon, where we, we cannot hold our meetings. Next, uh, on March 1, we're starting to have a new strategic plan for the Christian education department, because we discovered that we are facing new questions about how to be the church today, how to do Christian education in a different way. Today, I had a long talk about with a, per, with a person who works in Rabie, Esther, uh, Marlon knows, mm -hmm. about if you're not uh, involved on a platform, you know, where you can connect through the web, we cannot do work in the coming year, at least uh, in Lebanon and Syria. So we are trying to develop the way we communicate with churches and uh, the topics we will be dealing with, how do you, uh, you know, reach out for children who are uh, struggling with uh, psychological problems at this time, mental issues, the, the, of the well-being of the, of the teachers. Uh, I want to say, I was looking at the pictures and thought now you will come back and to find a new Lebanon and a new Syria. The economic crisis that we, we are going through uh, with the level of poverty that is in Syria and Lebanon pose questions, new questions to us about how can we be the church today? And we discovered that, you know, providing basic uh, uh, food for the people to be able to continue their life is being the church for today or provide a message for the corona and all this. So as Christian education, uh, we, we are keeping some of the, uh, you know, previous way of teaching the Bible through Sunday schools, making sure, uh, you know, this is carried on, but we are discovering that we need to change. We need to be technologically more involved with the kids. We need to do most of our schools in Lebanon, for example, on the web. No face-to-face -face education. So we have to do also Sunday school on the web. This is something that's developing uh -huh. uh, for, for us in that. Uh, I don't want to take all the time, but I want to say uh, honestly that the relation that we have, we grew through with the outreach and the support that we felt as a synod has really gave us strength all through the years. And it's the trust relation that we have in the several programs and the full support have lessened our pain as a church, has taught us to, to be the church for today. It's a tour for all of us because we are on a tour and on a journey of changing and asking the Lord, what do you want from us at this time? And every time the outreach come, uh, group comes and meets us, uh, we are changed as well. And we are both discovering what does it mean to be the church for today? Uh, and this is the beauty of our relation as the outreach. Uh, I always say to Joseph, my husband, our relation with the outreach is special because it's easy to support and stay far, but to be involved and not to get tired, we've never seen partners like that. And I usually uh, like to say good things in the back of people, but I want to say to the outreach, the way you did it and you keep supporting us has never, we've never seen this long commitment and the good part is that the commitment is going to the grassroots, the women, the youth, the work. And that will all give us confidence that when we leave, it will continue because these relations that were built. I'm sorry, I took more time than I should, but I want to say this as a witness for how much the outreach have done to the churches here. And you're coming, gives us strength, teaches us to learn together to be the church for today. Uh, we thank God that uh, the motivation is still there. And I always tell to my sister and to the many of the leadership that I see around here, you don't get tired. You could get tired of the Middle East because it's, it has been on and on and on. 
but outreach doesn't get tired and we are together. May God use us and these tours, they do change us before and they change you. And it gives us to be the church in a beautiful way. We are in a shaping time. I always say this Corona time is a shaping time for all of us. And we will grow to be a more beautiful church that looks like Christ in that. Thank you for coming. And I really look forward to meet you. Thank you. Thank you, dear Najla. My, my cat just came to say hello as well. Um, <laughs> this is Zoom Kitty. Um, and friends, we are going to wrap up. Thank you for sticking with us for a few minutes. And I'm, I'm going to put on notice Jack Baca, our board chair, who's going to close us with prayer. And, um, and I'm going to come to Joseph Kassab in, in just a minute to unmute himself as well, because we can't have the head of the church here without hearing the dulcet sound of his voice. Um, and he is such a good friend. So Joseph, I want you to come on and just bring your greeting as well. But I, on a practical basis for all of you who are here, thank you. Would welcome any kind of input you have of how we can fine tune this better, things that you found didn't work or were annoying. We're trying this for the first time. And so many of you know us, help us, write me, write outreach, tell us what we can do better because we're gonna try to do this again in another month to focus on Egypt. Um, for those of you who want to know more about this part of the world, write us, write, send an email through Outreach Foundation or me directly, Marilyn, at theoutreachfoundation.org. The world's longest email address is mine, Marilyn at the Outreach Foundation, on our website. But you can also, if you're on Facebook, go to my Facebook page. It's an open Facebook page, and I hardly do anything on it but post stories of the church in this part of the world. If you wanna hear their news, hear their stories, come track with that. And pray with us that come end of October, we have a tentative departure date of October 18 to go back to Lebanon, we hope into Syria. If you're interested in that, please let me know. You can do that, as I said, directly or through the Outreach Foundation website. Again, a lot is changing in the world, we don't know what it's gonna look like. We know God's in charge of it, but we are leaning toward that time that we can be present to one another. And so we're hoping that October will provide that opportunity. Joseph, please unmute yourself and, and bring some greeting. And then I'm gonna ask Jack Baca, our great board chair in Southern California to, to close us out. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the, the same, many familiar faces. I, I wanted to count the names and, and say it, but uh, I'm really uh, honored to be with such a group who is interested in, in our uh, ministry and our area. Two, two points I want to raise. You know, Lebanon now is in a financial and economic collapse. Uh, and... Uh, our wretched government, uh, they are in a deep problem. They don't know how to get out of it. So, uh, you know, watching this amazing presentation uh, by Marlin with those pictures, I think uh, you should be paid by the, by, by, by the Ministry of Tourism, by the Ministry of Tourism. Yeah, when I compare what, what our, uh, our government is doing in, with the people here and what uh, it did with the country, I mean, it's, it's terrible. This is another subject now. Uh, just I, I want uh, to say that I was watching the, while the picture displaying the ministry of the synod and the church, and uh, I was thinking, and now I will say what I thought of, uh, I was telling myself, when, when misery falls around the Church of Christ, that misery itself saves the Church of Christ from its misery. You know, we, we used to be, before the, the, the problems in Syria and Lebanon, we used to be a traditional Presbyterian church, uh, happy about our tradition and about uh, heritage, but the misery around us saved us from our misery. If you come and just compare, we are no more obsessed with the increasing our numbers as much as we, we, are, we are obsessed by increasing our impact, our impact around us. 
to show the love of Christ. And this is what we understand when, when Christ told uh, the people that you go uh, to J Jerusalem and beyond to Samaria. And, and, and I, I, think, I think that was, uh, uh, he, he meant that I'm not calling you for my church to, be, to join my, my theology, my identity. But it was a kind of go and tell people that here is the love of Christ reached you the same way mm -hmm. it reached us. So every time we get in contact with, with the Outreach Foundation, that's the message. They are telling us uh, uh, here, here the, the, the love of Christ is reaching you the same way it reached us. So this is our role as a family of God and uh, sister churches and communion of saints to, to tell this to each other and to the society. Thank you for giving me the time. I was, uh, uh, I was enjoying every part of that. Bless you. Thank you, dear Joseph and, and dear Najla for being part of this for each of you, both friends old and new. And again, particularly for those of us who may not yet be connected to this part of the world and want to know more about it, please reach out to me. I enjoy continually talking about the work and witness of the church in this place. And again, thank you for sticking with us a little bit longer. We'd welcome your feedback, how we can do a better job of this. But Jack Baca, I think you're out there somewhere. Jack Baca is the pastor of the Village Community Church in Rancho Santa Fe, but his greater distinction, I think, is as our president of our board and a person deeply committed to the work and witness of the church in Syria and Lebanon. So Jack, pray us out of here, my friend. Thank you, Marilyn. Let's uh, express a word of appreciation to Marilyn and to oh. Kelly and to uh, Mark for his background work in putting all of this together. Uh, and let's, uh, let's join together in the spirit of bonds and uh, fellowship and love. Lord, we give you our praise, our appreciation. We give you our attention. We give you all the glory uh, for all of the many, many gifts that have been celebrated uh, and lifted up in this time that we have spent together. Uh, we thank you especially uh, for the sisters and the brothers of the Synod of Syria and Lebanon. We thank you for Najla and for Joseph and the many partners whom we met uh, through this meeting. Media. We thank you for their faithfulness, their courage, their strength, their witness, their uh, learning. We thank you for all that they bring to us. We thank you, Lord, for the sisters and brothers uh, of the church here in the United States who are gathered together. We appreciate this way that we can be joined together again in fellowship, even though we are separated from each other physically. We pray your blessing, Lord, upon your church uh, all around the world, knowing that as as we face such great challenges uh, as the worldwide community, that you are greater than all of those challenges, that you are still about the business of renewing and redeeming and recreating all that is. And so we ask that you would keep us faithful, that you would keep us looking forward, uh, that you would keep, keep us looking to each other for the encouragement that we are able to give. Uh, we remember that in the words of scripture that as we gather to share with each other, we share not so much our own wisdom, but we share encouragement and support for each other, and we thank you for that. Bless and be with us then as we depart from each other. Uh, we look forward to that time when we can be physically together as we are spiritually and emotionally together now, and we look forward to that day when all of your children will be blessed with all of the gifts of this creation, especially with the knowledge of the love that you have shared with us and continue to share in the ministry of Jesus Christ in the world. We are privileged to be part of it, and we ask that it continue for your sake. We pray in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Bless God bless everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.